Our journey begins in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Cape Town, South Africa. There are far more flights from America to Johannesburg, South Africa's largest city, but I recommend flying directly to Cape Town if you can. Cape Town is magnificently beautiful. Perched on a peninsula beneath the looming Table Mountain National Park and surrounded by the South Atlantic, seemingly on all sides. Along the coastal strip, you could be forgiven for thinking you're in a South African Santa Monica. But once you discover Cape Town's downtown, you'll see it has a decidedly colonial feel, somewhat similar to cities in Australia or New Zealand. The legislative capital of South Africa, Cape Town was founded as a supply station for Dutch ships after sailing around the Cape of Good Hope with goods from India, Africa, and the Far East. In the downtown, you can wander old Dutch neighborhoods dating from the 1760s, which have now been gentrified for wealthy residents. Nearby, you can take a cable car or hike the 3,500 feet up Table Mountain, the stunning flat-topped plateau overlooking Cape Town. From here, you can see why Cape Town is rated as one of the world's most multicultural cities and was named the best place in the world to live by the New York Times. Most of the action in Cape Town is found outside the downtown, in the nearby beach towns of Hote Bay and Camps Bay. Here, on the perfect white sand beaches of South Africa's coast, a little bit of paradise is found. Under the high mountain peaks known as the Twelve Apostles, these public and free beaches are an excellent place to get a glimpse of post-apartheid South Africa, where whites and blacks enjoy a public space equally. But South Africa and Namibia are not far removed from the era of apartheid which radically divided minority whites from all other residents of the country. For more than 40 years, from 1948 until the early 1990s, racial segregation was rigidly enforced in South Africa and Namibia. These white supremacist policies put the descendants of colonial Europeans at the top of society with Asians, Indians, and Africans in descending order of privilege and influence below them. Under apartheid, black Africans were stripped of their right to vote and forbidden to marry whites. They were forbidden to own businesses in white-dominated areas, or even to go to white-owned hospitals. Huge numbers of black Africans were moved out of prosperous white districts to government-built planned black cities called townships. Although institutionalized apartheid was formally dismantled in 1991, the poverty-stricken townships of South Africa still stand. 
In Cape Town, they occupy the vast Cape Flats region, an almost unimaginable district of tin and concrete huts and abject poverty stretching as far as the eye can see. I felt compelled to visit the townships of Cape Town during my stay here, as many tourists do when visiting the big cities of South Africa. Driving out from the city center, I was astonished to see literally thousands of unmarked white vans coming into the city, as they do each morning, bringing Cape Town's endless supply of affordable labor to a finite number of jobs. It's a phenomenon that always made me feel uncomfortable. These vast, vast tracts of poverty, unlike anything you'll ever see in the West, all provide an insanely cheap standard of life for the white Afrikaner and the privileged tourist. From this infinite labor pool come all the workers, tradesmen, builders, hotel and restaurant employees, and almost every other blue collar job in the country. Yet the standard of living is heartbreaking. The disparity of wealth is shocking and astonishing. Part of the problem in talking about the townships is that nothing is black and white, even though the economic disparity clearly is. I recommend you bring a local guide when visiting the townships, rather than taking a bus tour or avoiding them entirely. Safety is a concern, but should not be an obsession. In general, the townships are safer and friendlier than you might think they are. We took two excellent local guides, Nico Sananthi Solomon and Sakumzi Mati, both of whom grew up here. Their knowledge and enthusiasm were instrumental in helping us understand life in the townships. In spite of it all, there's a defiant sense of optimism here, which seems almost antithetical to the level of poverty. Even though the surroundings could be interpreted as depressing, I found the spirit of the people to be engaging and lively. It's important to remember that the very low cost to visit Namibia and South Africa is because of the work of hard-working Africans who live just like this. The value in seeing this side of South African life and its struggles and optimism is one of the most thought-provoking travel experiences you'll have here. Don't miss out on it. Before leaving South Africa, we were eager to journey down the Cape Peninsula to visit the historic Cape of Good Hope legendary home of the Flying Dutchman. The Chapman Peak Road to the Cape is something to behold. By any standards, this is not a road for the faint of heart, and left-hand driving makes it even more precarious. Under avalanche tunnels you travel, until the Cape of Good Hope comes into view. Eventually, you will arrive at Cape Point, 
the end of Africa, but not quite its southernmost point. That honor is held by Cape Hanklip, a few hundred miles away. Nevertheless, the Cape Point Lighthouse marks the place of legend, the Cape of Good Hope. According to legend, off this cape once sailed a mysterious ghost ship called the Flying Dutchman. This phantom Dutch ship was lost at sea in the 18th century with all hands aboard. But its ghost is still seen in storms and is a portent of bad luck. Many a modern sailor has claimed to see this ghostly ship illuminated and sailing by itself around the spooky headlands of the Cape of Good Hope. More likely to be seen than ghosts, however, is the marvelous wildlife the Cape has to offer. From great white sharks to dolphins to sea lions, the region is rich in aquatic wonders. This South Atlantic right whale mother and calf provide a wonderful study. In this amazing moment, the whales are approached by a school of Adriatic dolphin, and the baby calf is pushed forward by the mother to meet and greet the curious playmates. New friends are made between species off the coast of South Africa. But perhaps the Cape's biggest attraction are the small colonies of African penguins found along the coast in several protected areas. On some of these beaches, the penguins have simply taken over and have the right of way. You'll be able to watch them go about their daily lives right under your nose. Like all penguins, the African penguin is flightless and comes ashore to mate and raise its young for only a couple of months each year. African penguins form strong pair bonds and are monogamous for life. Females dig a burrow in the sand where they lay two eggs. Both parents take turns incubating the eggs for up to 40 days. Once the chicks hatch, they grow quickly and have a hairy brown coat. African penguins make a sound similar to a donkey's call, which is why they're so commonly called the jackass penguin, although seldom to their faces. Pink markings above the eyes are from a gland which helps regulate body temperature. In general, the pinker the gland, the hotter the day. But when it really gets too hot for jackass penguins, they just take to the water to cool off. And it's here that they are at their most agile and graceful. Imagine yourself swimming through a giant school of anchovies, the perfect dinner menu item for a penguin. And then to find this giant school of fish, known as a bait ball, being herded across the bay by the penguins, like a giant hurricane of swimming snacks. Penguins can shepherd this movable feast through the bay like a giant moving snack bar, darting through it from time to time for a quick bite to eat.
main focus of my travels this time was the fascinating country of Namibia on the southwest coast of Africa. There are very few convenient flights from America to Namibia, so most people opt to take a two-hour flight from Cape Town to the capital city of Windhoek. There's a good reason for this. Namibia has only recently begun to experience the crush of tourism, and its small, antiquated airport is barely able to cope with the increased visitor traffic. Having said this, it's vitally important that you reserve a four-wheel drive high-clearance vehicle if you intend to drive yourself around Namibia. Namibia's roads are mostly dirt, and distances between towns or outposts can be long and dusty. The roads are generally well-maintained, so this is not a tough four-wheel drive adventure, but you want a comfortable and sturdy vehicle for this trip, like the Toyota Hilux, which we rented for three weeks. These vehicles aren't cheap, but this is one expense not to skimp on, and we found prices for rental cars were about half in downtown Windhoek as compared to the airport. Namibia's capital city, Windhoek, is a very pleasant surprise, and nothing like many other chaotic and disorganized cities of West Africa. Like just about every town in Namibia, Windhoek is historically Germanic, meaning things are well organized, neat, clean, and livable. Having said this, there isn't much reason to stay here for long if you've limited time in the country. Much of Namibia's income today comes from livestock grazing on about 4,000 cattle, sheep, and goat farms. About a third of these are black-owned and produce some of the finest livestock in Africa. The land is notoriously dry, less than seven inches of rain per year. And yet somehow, through proper grazing and water management, cattle herds survive. A few of these massive cattle farms have been reclaimed as wildlife parks where ecotourism flourishes. The most famous and attractive of these is a Rindi private game reserve on the plains of central Namibia, about a three hour drive from Windhoek. As you enter the park, you're struck by the utter remoteness of this place. 275 square miles of wilderness in all directions. This is an experience not to be missed. At the heart of it, the marvelous Old Trader's Lodge, an affordable but luxurious eco-lodge built squarely around one of the great watering holes of the world for humans and animals alike. Wildlife are the true owners of Arindi Game Reserve, and humans are protected only by a high-voltage electric fence around the compound. It's a strange feeling to know that just a few volts of electricity are all that keeps you from being the next meal for any number of hungry animals roaming the plain for 300 miles in any direction. And probably not any more comforting to know is that at least two species, baboons and wild dogs, have learned to get into the compound by climbing up the support poles on the electric fences, carefully avoiding the electrodes that would shock them. In spite of all this, you'll feel very safe and well taken care of here at Arindi. The photo ops are utterly magnificent, and these shots were taken from our back porch. Of course, while you can see the world from the watering hole in your room, no one should miss taking a safari here in Arindi Reserve. Safaris in many countries are expensive, but not here. Because Namibia uses the South African rand for currency, the value of a safari like this is amazing. 
A drive like this one may cost less than $50 per day per person, and oh, what an adventure you will have. Your safari is only as good as your guides, and we had two of the best Namibia has to offer. Stephen Krukamp and Paul Dumernick, with our native guide Sanani, spotting wildlife from the hood. We had four days and many trips with this team, and it seemed we had the park to ourselves most of the time. If you like safaris where you don't see many people, but see lots of wildlife and the food and drinks are good, this is your park. Get the bar <laughs> and the Look bartender. <laughs> Let's see, the drink of choice in Africa is the? Brandy and Coke. Brandy and Coke. Yes. And I love it. And I threw it just the way I love it, so you guys would love it as well. <laughs> Sounds perfect. The other day, yes, the old tracks. Yeah. The old tracks of him. But you didn't see him? No. One of the advantages of Arindi Park is the ability for jeeps to travel off-road. Animals don't always travel along well-marked roads, and our expert trackers were able to follow them deep into the bush, sometimes having to hack away at the vegetation to get there. And if you think this is too destructive to the natural landscape, it's nothing compared to what elephants do every day. The wildlife opportunities here in Namibia are the best I've experienced in all my African travels. You're all alone here with the wildlife and far from civilization. One bonus to Arindi is that it's now home to some of Africa's recently bred wild dog population. Sometimes called the painted dog, African wild dogs are one of the rarest and most endangered species in the world. Only about 1,400 are left on the entire continent. Extremely rare to see anywhere in Africa and not able to be domesticated, Arindi has released several dozen into the wild. This park remains one of the few in the world where you can witness African wild dogs hunting in packs and up close. Now, a word of warning. Sometimes you're gonna see some of the best wildlife you've ever seen on Earth. Other times you may find yourself waiting quite a while for the right photo op. At times like these, Paul and Stephen took it upon themselves to explain the finer points of, well, dung. And when our enthusiasm for dung samplers ran dry, they amused us with the Olympic Games of all Namibian guides, a dung spitting contest. Okay, go. One thing that makes Irindi so unique is that they allow tourists to fly their drones within the park, something virtually unknown anywhere else in Africa. And as a photographer, my dream come true.
Our native guide, Sanani, was endlessly fascinated by the drone and the amazing perspectives it offered. One day he surprised me with a homemade drone of his own, a stick with a dung ball and guinea fowl feather on each end. And when you threw it into the sky, it would come twirling down like a helicopter. We came to call it Sanani's Drone, and it became my favorite souvenir from my trip to Namibia. For tens of thousands of years, the Bushmen of Namibia have been wandering these lands as nomads. Their tribes and territories have been carefully marked without fences. As stewards of the environment here, they're the first to encounter and protect the animals they depend on from trespassers and poachers. <laughs> Cave art and tools clearly show the Bushmen have been living in this region for more than 70,000 years. They live in small seasonal villages around mostly temporary shelters. At times, their hastily built huts are meant to be used for just one night as they move about, and at others form seasonal villages around traditional watering holes. Women gather fruits, nuts, and berries, while men hunt for meat. The diet includes grasshoppers and beetles, as well as moths, termites, and butterflies. Drought is a very real concern, as watering holes often dry up. A bushman can always make a fire from available elements in the wild. Similar tools date back 42,000 years. Social life consists of much socializing, joking, dancing, and singing. The dancing is ceremonial and can result in the dancers going into trances. As a rule, children have very few responsibilities. San Bushmen have a formidable reputation as trackers and hunters. They can follow tracks for days and then fell a large animal with deadly poison-tipped arrows. Hit with a poison arrow, it can also take days for an animal to die. Cheetahs are the fastest species of animal on land, but one thing they can't seem to outrun is their own extinction. A century ago, there were 100,000 cheetahs in the wild. Today, there are fewer than 7,000. And that's why I think the next place you must visit in Namibia after a Rindi Game Reserve is the inspiring Cheetah Conservation Fund. They have a few small rooms for rent on their sprawling campus, and here you will get a first-hand glimpse at Africa's most renowned efforts to save this big cat. 
Because they are the most passive and unassertive of the big cats, cheetahs don't compete on big game reserves with other large, aggressive carnivores. In fact, there's no record of a cheetah ever attacking a human. But because they are so unaggressive, they often get pushed out onto rural farmland where they prey on farm animals and have been shot by ranchers. Even more horrific, cheetahs are a prized pet by wealthy Saudi collectors who pay poachers to have adult cheetahs shot so they can collect the babies and smuggle them to the Middle East. The Cheetah Conservation Fund works to raise orphan cheetahs whose parents have been shot by hunters or collectors. As they grow, they're given the finest care humans have to offer and become an important part of the fund's outreach, research, and educational efforts. Recently, the Cheetah Fund has begun raising Anatolian Shepherd Dogs, which are specially trained to protect farm animals without attacking or harming cheetahs. As puppies, the Anatolian Shepherds are put into the pens of sheep and goats. As they grow up, they come to think of the herd as their pack and will run off any predators that approach. These dogs have become wildly popular all across Namibia, and now there's a waiting list for each one to join a rancher. Today you can visit this fascinating place and see the baby orphans who've grown up to be full-fledged beautiful cats. You can watch as the trainers keep them exercised and fed. And even more fun, for a small fee, you can go out in the morning on the feeding run, riding in the back of the truck, as the hungry cheetahs follow fast behind and alongside you. And if you're lucky, you might even be invited to feed the cheetahs a full rack of ribs. <laughs> 